Sometimes we have those friends who seem to stay in bad relationships for way too long. Everyone on the outside can see that this relationship is not healthy, it's toxic and draining. But when that relationship is full of threats of self-harming or threats on the other person's well-being, then this type of relationship can feel impossible to end. And that is what happened in this case. Brad Lewis wanted out, but as soon as he finally put his foot down, things took the most tragic and devastating turn possible. But before we get into the case, I am so excited to tell you all about the sponsor of today's video, which is Billy. I love Billy overall just as a brand, but I also love their products. Billy is on a mission to champion womankind. As a brand, they want to relieve us of the harmful pressures that lead us into participating in shame-based routines that leave some women feeling pressured to shave and achieve that flawless, hairless, and airbrushed look. Instead, they want to introduce the beginning of a joy-based routine that makes you feel good about your body's natural hair and skin. Billy's award-winning five-blade razor allows you to achieve a super smooth, clean shave that leaves your skin feeling soft and free of razor burn. The razor Razor literally glides over your skin for a comfortable shave with blades that are well spaced to avoid clogging. And as a pink girly myself, if you can't tell by my hair and my little decorations, I am so excited about Billy's most glitzy glam razor yet. You can get their adorable pink glitter razor in their starter kit where you will get a super cute matching magnetic holder to display it in your shower and keep your razor safe and dry, as well as two blade refills to keep you stocked up, all for only $10. I also have their whipped shaving cream, which can I just say, comes in literally the cutest packaging I have ever seen. The whipped shaving cream makes my shaving experience so much smoother. The razor just glides so perfectly with the shaving cream. It feels like a dream. I honestly hardly feel the razor at all. Then for when I travel, which happens to be a lot this year, I have their travel cover to protect my razor no matter where I am. I'm someone who doesn't always shave my legs. I don't always want to. I don't always feel like it. So I really only shave when I feel like it or when I want to. For me, I like to shave when I'm going swimming or going to be outside a lot because I don't know how men deal with it, but I hate it when the wind blows or the water swishes around my leg and I can feel the leg hair moving. It always feels like something's touching my leg or like brushing up against me. It's so weird. I, I Is it just me? I don't know. Probably. Yeah, but that's why I like to keep it smooth on my legs. That's why I shave. Billy's razors are super affordable at half the price of old school drugstore razors. No more worries about the pink tax anymore because we as women have been paying extra for our women's razors for way too long. Now I can have my cute pink sparkly razor for a lower cost than your typical boring razor. So give Billy a try for yourself. Head to the link in the description box below and you can get 10% off any order above $20 when you use code Rachel. Once again, head to the link down below and use code Rachel for 10% off of your order of $20 or more. And with Billy, shipping is free always and forever. Thank you again so much to Billy for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we will be discussing the tragic case of Bradley Lewis. 22-year-old Bradley Lewis was born to parents Steve Lewis and Rachel Hawkins, and he is from the city of Bristol in England. According to Steve and Rachel, Brad was known to be kind, compassionate, and popular. He was a part of a very close-knit family and was known to love and adore his siblings. Brad loved playing football, or as we call it in the U.S., soccer, playing for Hanham Athletic Club for several seasons. According to those who played with him, he was always so friendly and personable. He was known to make friends easily, and if you were friends with him, you had a friend for life. Brad was also the loving father of four children. He had one daughter, Scarlett, with a woman named Lee, and the rest of his children he had with 24-year-old Abigail White, with whom he had been in a relationship for over five years. Now, Abigail was known to never have, like, a full-time, stable job, but she did make money at one point. She was on OnlyFans, calling herself the fake Barbie, posting explicit content that subscribers had to pay her to see. So that is how she brought in money for a while. I'm not exactly sure when she started, 
but it was stated that she was among some of the first users when it first started, so right off the bat, she was making quite a bit of money. In the first year, she made about 55,000 pounds, but as more women joined the platform, the money started slowing down. So, after that first year, she was making about 1,000 pounds per month. According to Abby, she had spoken with Brad about posting and he seemed to be okay with it. That seemed to be her only source of income while Brad was the main breadwinner working in flooring and I believe there were times that he had two jobs because obviously he had to support an entire family. After Abby became pregnant for the first time though, she did stop posting to OnlyFans altogether. So, for the following years, she was not bringing in any money. However, those who knew the couple said that they had a very very toxic, volatile, and even violent relationship. Now, depending on who you ask, there are different versions of who was the more controlling one, who was the more violent one. But for the sake of this part of the video, I will try to explain what both sides have said, but we will discuss more in depth about their relationship later in the video. To start, we know that there was infidelity on both sides. Both of them had sexual partners outside of the relationship, and as with so many of these toxic, controlling relationships, it seemed that even though Abby was also cheating, she was constantly trying to catch Brad cheating. If she accused him, he would always deny it and always try to keep the cheating a secret, but of course, she always knew deep down what he was doing. She would try and follow him when he went out to catch him with other women and things like that. Also during their relationship, Abby expected constant attention from Brad. She would expect him to text her constantly, and if there were times that he didn't reply fast enough or didn't reply at all, she would get furious and grew increasingly volatile. To me, it seemed like the two had a very toxic and unstable relationship to begin with. I don't know when the cheating started, but it seemed that as time went on and the cheating and arguing continued, Abby grew more possessive, more controlling, and more violent. We see this a lot in these toxic cycles where one person is constantly pushing and prodding the other person, trying to get a reaction out of them. Then when that person reacts or starts pulling away, the other person gets obsessive. They demand your constant time and attention, and if you don't give it to them, they lash out. That was seen in text messages and voice messages that Abby sent to friends. In some text messages, she called Brad a liar, saying that she needed to beat the truth out of him. She told one friend that she wanted to kill Brad, but she couldn't go to jail. In another message, she said that she wanted to kill the girl that she suspected Brad of cheating on her with, but she continued saying that she couldn't risk going to jail. Then, according to those voice messages, Abby told a friend that she couldn't control her anger and she never believed a word that Brad said. She said that friends told her that one of them would end up dead if they continued the way they were going. She said that the only time he tells her the truth is when she threatens to kill him, like when she gets a knife out. Honestly, I have no limit when I get angry. And like, obviously he said that I need help with that because people are generally saying to me, one of you are gonna end up dead. Like, and I fully believe that I'm quite capable of killing him if he hurts me again. And, or I'm gonna end up being in prison. But I don't believe a word that comes out of that boy's mouth. I have to beat the living daylights out of him for him to tell me the truth. And he still doesn't tell me the truth. He only tells me the truth when he thinks I'm gonna kill him. Like when I get a knife out, like, when I stab him, like, oh, I just, I just don't get this kid. So clearly, we can hear that she's fully aware that she gets angry, lashes out, and reacts in ways that are simply not healthy. She knows that. But as the relationship went on, things just got more violent and out of control. She started threatening Brad's life. She told him on one occasion that she was going to destroy him, his family, and everyone and everything he loved. Then there was one night where things got out of control. She got angry, she thought Brad was cheating on her, and threatened to stab him in the face. But instead, she actually lashed out and stabbed him in the leg, leaving a lifelong scar. 
That, I believe, was a few months before his death. Then, several weeks after that, on March 19th, only a week before his death, she stabbed him in the arm once again after accusing him of cheating, and this stabbing did require medical treatment to fix it. Obviously, this whole part of the relationship was extremely abusive and violent, and throughout this time, Brad told friends that he was scared of Abby, and we can see why. He told friends that he wanted to leave her to get out of this horrible relationship, but anytime he brought it up or tried breaking up with her, she would threaten to kill herself, and ultimately, the two always made up. Text messages would later show that there were multiple, multiple times where Brad tried breaking up with Abby, but she would always threaten her own life. Then, one of them would profess their love for one another, and each time, it ended up with them getting back together. Of course, because of how volatile their relationship was, Child Protective Services had gotten involved. Again, Abby and Brad had three young children together. After Child Protective Services got involved, they told the couple that they were not allowed to live together anymore. But despite that, for months, they chose to live together in Kingswood, in secret, of course, hiding that fact from the authorities. But at some point, Brad decided that enough was enough. By early 2022, Brad decided to move out of the home he shared with Abby and moved back in with his mother. Things obviously were not in a great place for the couple, and it seemed that Brad wanted out of the relationship altogether. At that point, after he moved out, they were not supposed to have really any contact with one another, according to Child Protective Services. After moving out, though, Abby and Brad continued texting and communicating back and forth until ultimately, they agreed to meet up and talk. By the afternoon of March 25th, 2022, Brad met up with Abby and another friend at the park where he told her that he no longer wanted to be with her. He also finally admitted that day that he had been unfaithful and that he had had been sleeping with other women. This was the first time that Brad actually admitted it, though again, we know that Abby suspected him of cheating for a very long time, and she pretty much knew it as fact for a very long time. However, once again, Brad breaking up with Abby was something that happened on a regular basis, and it wasn't something that ever stuck. Both of them would always threaten the relationship, and they would tell each other that they didn't want to be together, but neither of them actually ever meant it. Brad would also make sure to shower Abby with gifts or flowers after she accused him of cheating, so Abby was expecting that this time was going to be no different. She expected him to make it up to her. After this meeting at the park, Abby suggested that the pair meet up at a pub to talk about things more. So, later that afternoon, by 5.30 p.m., CCTV footage captured Abby, a group of her friends, as well as their children, all arriving at the Horseshoe Pub in Kingswood. But Brad didn't show up until much later. According to friends, Abby was very upset that Brad wasn't there, and the longer it took for him to show up, the more irritable she became. She continued drinking as she waited, which of course caused her emotions to heighten even further. Friends would later say that she ended up having a pint of beer as well as several shots and maybe even a few hard drinks. One friend who had been in contact with Brad told her to calm down, assuring her that Brad would be showing up soon. At one point, Abby and her friend went to the bathroom and there she started crying and shouting, telling her friend that she believed that Brad was unfaithful. She was worried that he was taking so long to arrive because he was with another woman. Finally, by 6.48 p.m., Brad showed up to the pub, but at that point, according to witnesses, Abby flew into a rage. Apparently, Abby wanted to go off alone with Brad to speak with him, but he refused to do that. He wanted to stay there with their friends in a public area. There were also times where he turned his back to Abby and was chatting with others and sort of disengaging with Abby, but the more he did this, the more enraged she became. She started verbally and physically berating him, she threw a drink in his face, and even started punching him and slapping him in front of everyone. When a friend of Brad's tried breaking the two up, she spat in Brad's face as well as the friend's face. 
she was in a nasty mood and nothing or no one could stop her. Even being in a fully public setting with her children and other children with her own friends, that wasn't enough for her to control her behavior and stop herself from lashing out. At some point in this, Brad and one of his friends retreated to the bathroom where Brad told his friends that he was afraid of Abby and was desperate to get away from her but he felt unable to because he was worried that she was going to kill herself. Once Brad came back and things calmed down a bit, Abby decided that she wanted to leave the pub with Brad, but Brad still had two or three pints left of beer in front of him to finish before leaving. Of course, when you go to the pub or a bar or whatever, you want to finish the drinks that you ordered because you paid for them. So that is what Brad told Abby, but according to witnesses, she just swept the drinks off the table and said, now you don't have any left. As all of that was happening with Abby freaking out and verbally and physically assaulting those around her, a woman in her 30s, someone not known to the couple, approached their table to ask them what was going on. To this, Abby replied, who the F are you? And the man that was with the woman then told Abby not to speak to his missus like that, and Abby responded by throwing a drink in the man's face and slapping him. So the man struck her back, knocking her to the ground. After the man struck her, Brad stepped in and told the man not to hit Abby like that, but it was too late. Abby was furious at that point, and she blamed Brad. She said that it was his fault for him letting the man hit her. During this whole altercation, Abby even called the authorities to report this man for attacking her, conveniently leaving out the fact that she hit him first and she started the whole thing. During the call, I guess she hung up on the operator, so they called her back, and at that point, she gave a false name to support her story. According to later review of the CCTV footage from that pub, it was clear that Abby was the one causing problems. She was acting absolutely hysterically and causing a huge commotion at the pub. After the altercation broke out, the argument continued, and by that point, Brad decided that it was best if him and Abby just left. So, one of the friends that was with them, Alfie Pike, offered to drive them home. As they were sort of gathering themselves and preparing to leave, there was a little break in the argument. And at that time, Brad said to Alfie, quote, I'm dead when I get home. Alfie asked what Brad meant by that, to which Brad replied, I'm dead when I get home. Alfie didn't know what to respond to that, and I do believe Abby heard him say that, but Abby did not say anything in response. As all of that was happening, with Brad deciding that they should just get home, some of the other friends in the group urged Brad not to leave with Abby. They knew how volatile Abby could get, and she was clearly not stopping her rampage anytime soon. His friends feared for his safety, but nonetheless, they wanted to leave, so Alfie drove him, Abby, and one of their children home to where they once lived together in Kingsman, arriving by 7.50 p.m. Before Brad got out of the car, Alfie gave him his number, telling him to call him if he needed anything. It was reported that shortly after being dropped off, he did call Alfie, but I'm not sure if he answered, but only four minutes after that, at 7.54 p.m., Brad called another friend, Sophie. Now, the relationship between Brad and Sophie seems a little bit complicated. Sophie was one of Abby's best friends, and she knew a lot about the relationship between her and Brad. Sophie was the one that Abby would confide in, and in a lot of the text messages she sent about wanting to kill Brad or beat him up, they were to Sophie. But as their relationship went on, Brad and Sophie formed a friendship as well. So that night, Brad called Sophie saying, quote, help me, Sophie. She's trying to kill me. She keeps beating me up. She's trying to stab me. She's hurting me. And as the call was going on, Sophie heard Abby in the background yelling at him to shut the F up as he cried out for help. By 8 p.m., a neighbor, Laura Kundi, heard what sounded like screaming and calls for help coming from outside of Abby's house. She heard a male voice calling for help and a female voice yelling and screaming, saying that she couldn't get emergency services. She was also screaming, he can't breathe. 
After hearing this, Laura called 999 and started heading over to Abby's home to see what was going on. As she arrived, she saw Abby standing outside trying to call 999, and as Laura entered the home, she saw a little boy standing in the doorway of the living room looking like a deer caught in headlights. When she entered the home, Laura walked into a horrific scene which just to pause, Laura certainly is brave for putting herself in that position. She had no idea what was going on. She heard yelling and screaming, and for all she knew, someone dangerous could have broken into their home and was killing everybody in sight. But Laura headed straight in. She entered the kitchen, and there she found Brad lying on the floor covered in blood with open wounds to his chest. There was blood smeared all over the floors and around the home, and it was clear that Abby had tried mopping up some of the blood. There were also sounds of the washer going as if Abby had just put clothes in to wash them. In the hallway, Abby found a knife, also covered in blood with a blade about six or seven inches long, lying on top of the radiator. After seeing all of this, Laura immediately jumped into action. She described that she saw Bradley looking pale and unresponsive, but she did notice some shallow breathing. She spotted a t-shirt in the kitchen, and at the direction of the 999 operator, she used that to start putting pressure on his chest wound. As she did that, she asked Abby what happened. To note, at the time, Abby was wearing a pink dress. She did have a bruise on her arm, but she didn't have any blood on her. After being asked, she told her neighbor that Brad did this to himself. Laura inquired further, asking what led to this. Were they fighting or arguing? And Abby said yes, but once again, that Brad did this to himself. At this point, Abby was absolutely hysterical. She was screaming to Laura, why aren't they responding? What's taking so long? She started touching Brad's face, saying, we love you, stay with me, stay with me. Laura said that she was trying to count Brad's breathing and trying to concentrate on helping him, but Abby's screeching and crying made that really difficult. Then, in the middle of this scene of panic and chaos, the little child in the home said to Laura, mommy did it. As they waited for paramedics to arrive, Laura's husband showed up to the home to help. It took several minutes for emergency services to arrive, but when they did, they attempted CPR before loading Brad into the stretcher to be transported to the hospital. As the paramedics worked to save Brad and were taking him away, Abby was so hysterical that Laura and her husband had to pin her to the wall to prevent her from getting in the middle of everything. Ambulances took Brad to the hospital, while officers also transported Abby to the hospital after she demanded to be with him. As she sat and waited with the officers, she alternated between crying and screaming and asking to see him, while also ensuring officers that she did nothing wrong. She said that she was not responsible for what happened to Brad. At the hospital, doctors worked hard to try and save Brad. He went in for emergency surgery, and they did everything they could, but nothing they did was enough. Hours later, by around 1 a.m. on March 26th, Brad died from his injuries. Shortly after his death, he was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy, and there, it was found that he was stabbed one time to the chest, which penetrated through the gaps between his ribs and ultimately into his heart, killing him. According to the medical examiner, the wound ended in a ventricle, so it wasn't possible to say exactly how deep the wound was, but it was at least seven centimeters deep. After this, of course, Abby was arrested on suspicion of Brad's murder and was taken into the police station for questioning. There, she refused to answer any questions, but she did meet with a lawyer who helped her prepare a written statement, which she gave to police. In her statement, she described that the night started with them arguing. As the argument got more heated, Brad reached for a kitchen knife from the sideboard. At that point, she was afraid that Brad was going to harm himself with the knife, so she took the knife from him and left the kitchen with it, intending to run to the front door to throw it outside. But Brad caught up with Abby, grabbing her hand, and stabbed himself in the chest with the knife. So basically, at this point, she probably knows that police will find her fingerprints on the knife. 
There will probably also be blood evidence to show that she was holding the knife while Brad was stabbed. So, to explain that away, she told officers that Brad stabbed himself while Abby was holding the knife. Again, this was after she had met with her lawyer, so I'm sure the lawyer gave her a lot of really good advice to come up with this story. But again, she said that she was holding the knife when Brad stabbed himself, but she was only holding it to prevent this exact situation from happening. She was trying to prevent Brad from stabbing himself. Within two minutes of Brad stabbing himself, Abby tried calling for an ambulance, but she was having trouble getting through, so she went outside to get better signal. It was at that time that Laura heard her screaming and yelling, saying that Brad wasn't breathing and she wasn't able to get emergency services. That was the story that Abby stuck with until July of 2022, when she changed her plea with the courts. She decided to plead guilty to manslaughter, telling the courts that she did stab him, but she did not mean to kill him. For those of you who don't know, manslaughter means that someone killed another person without intention to kill or cause serious bodily injury. So, drunk driving is a great example. Someone who is not in a position to be driving and they know that, they know they're drunk, but they still make the choice to get behind the wheel of a car. As a result, they hit someone and kill them. They didn't intend to kill anybody, but their actions directly caused someone's death. Basically, Abby was claiming that yes, her stabbing Brad caused his death, but she didn't actually intend to hurt or kill him when she stabbed him. So she was now telling officers a new version of the story. Once again, we know that the whole altercation started with the two of them fighting. Once in the home, the argument continued and they ended up in the hallway between the living room and the kitchen. She said that she started walking away from Brad and towards the kitchen to separate herself from the argument and try and calm down. But as she got into the kitchen, she saw a knife on the counter. She decided in that moment to pick up the knife to scare Brad. She described that she held the knife with the blade pointing down the same way that she had held it before when she stabbed him those two other times in the leg and then in the arm as we described earlier. She went up to Brad with the knife only intending to scare him, but instead she thrust the knife into his chest only realizing what she did until after she stabbed him. She said that it was over before she even thought about anything. After realizing what she had just done, she started cleaning up the blood from the kitchen and threw some bloody clothes into the washer and changed her outfit. She then used that short period of time to come up with her story. She said that she regrets lying about what happened initially, saying that she really just did not realize what she had done. However, her accepting responsibility in the sense that it was more of an accident was not enough for prosecutors in this case. So, by October of 2022, they took 24-year-old Abby White to trial for the murder of her boyfriend, 22-year-old Bradley Lewis. The prosecution argued that Abby and Bradley always had a very toxic relationship. Abby was controlling, possessive, manipulative, and violent. She demanded constant attention from Brad, constantly ordering him to buy her flowers, gifts, and show other forms of affection by responding to messages right away. But no matter what Brad did, it was never enough. Abby just had a very nasty, toxic personality, and as she treated Brad worse and worse, he did go outside of the relationship to find companionship elsewhere. And of course, once that started, things only got worse. Brad expressed multiple times how he wanted to leave Abby. He was scared of her. She hurt him. She threatened him and even stabbed him two times. But if he tried to leave, she threatened her own life. And he didn't want to be responsible for someone's death someone he had once loved and cared so deeply for. Of course, to prove that Abby was the cause of the abuse and the toxicity in the relationship, the prosecution brought up the text messages and voice messages, how she told multiple friends on multiple occasions that she planned to kill him. She said that she had to beat him or threaten him just to get him to tell the truth. We heard it from her own words in that voice recording that I played earlier. Then, police uncovered several messages from Amy to Brad where she had threatened to kill him, others, or herself. 
On February 7th, there is one message sent from Abby to Brad, which says, I swear to God, I'll stab you. Later that day, she writes, I'm going to kill myself. After that, there are several messages where she's threatening to kill him and the woman she thinks he's sleeping with. By March 21st, there's a message from Abby to Brad, once again, threatening to kill herself. She also writes, I'm going to stab you in the effing neck. There are also several messages from Brad expressing that she was disloyal, cheating on him several times, saying that she broke his heart. He said that he thinks their relationship should end, but once again, she threatens her own life. She wrote in one message, I'm going to kill myself on your mom's doorstep. She also threatened to kill him once again. From March 22nd through the 25th, there are more messages between them. At this time, they are living apart and have been ordered by Child Protective Services to stop seeing each other. Brad continues to tell Abby that he is in agony, not only from the cheating and the breakup and all of it, but also from literally being stabbed. He says repeatedly that he doesn't want to argue with her, and that is when they set up to meet at the park on the 25th. After that plan is set, they continue to text for the following days, where Brad tells Abby that she is suffocating him and that she needs to stop. Abby asked him to come to her home multiple times, but he refused. He said that they need to stop their relationship, and of course, there are more threats made from Abby. In the course of these threats, Abby also says multiple times that she is done with Brad, but to me, it seems like she is only doing this to get a reaction out of Brad, but when she doesn't get the reaction she's looking for, she just gets more irritated. Like, when she says she's done, she's expecting him to be like, oh no, I didn't mean it, please take me back. But when he doesn't and basically agrees to break up, she can't take it. It just makes her even more angry. After the two meet up in the park, once again, they agree to meet up at the pub, and from there, we know what happened. Basically, the prosecution is arguing that based on these volatile messages, we can see that Abby was and always has been the aggressor. She was violent, threatening, and finally, after Brad officially decided that enough was enough, she acted out and murdered him. The prosecution said that even though she immediately regretted her actions after the stabbing, which they said was very clear, and I agree, it was very clear that she regretted it immediately, that doesn't mean that she didn't intentionally kill him to begin with. On the other hand, the defense said that Abby loved Brad and never wanted to hurt him. They said that the toxicity and violence came from both sides. They said that Brad was a serial cheater, gaslighting Abby and making her feel horrible all throughout the relationship. They also said that he was controlling. They said that when Abby had her OnlyFans and was making all that money, Brad controlled how she spent it, never letting her use her money on what she wanted. They brought forward witnesses who all stated that Abby was pleasant, kind, and a good partner. Yes, she had anger issues, but it was because of a mental health disorder. She didn't choose to be the way she was. So, going off that, of course, the defense brought in a psychiatrist who evaluated Abby. The psychiatrist told the jury that Abby had a very rough life from the very start. She witnessed her father beating her mother on a regular basis. When she was four, her parents finally split, but when her mom remarried, her stepfather was no better. He physically abused little Abby before she was finally taken away and put into foster care. After that, she finally lived with her grandparents, who treated her well and raised her to the best of their abilities. However, of course, even though Abby was finally put into a more stable home when she was a teenager, she was deeply affected by her early childhood. She started to do poorly in school and she had behavioral problems and her issues with lashing out and being quick to anger started as a child. She had even attempted suicide twice, once when she was 13 and again when she was 16. Then when she was 16, she started a relationship with a 29-year-old man, which I obviously, is seriously disturbing and wrong. After that, this is when she started dating Brad. So, it appears that she was about 17 or 18 while Brad was 15 or 16 when their relationship started. I do want to note that I'm not exactly sure when Brad had Scarlett with the other woman. I think I saw in some reports that he did 
get this woman pregnant while cheating on Abby. So Scarlett, his other daughter, and then the mother of that daughter, Lee, I think was when he was cheating on Abby. I do believe that. It could be wrong, but that is what I've seen in reports, that he did get another woman pregnant while with Abby, but it wasn't exactly stated what the whole situation was and if it was Scarlett. I'm not exactly sure. Either way, going back to Abby. From the age of about 13, Abby drank alcohol regularly and did cocaine socially, but she was never dependent on either substance. As a teenager, she dealt with depression, being prescribed medication to help. From there, she had worked with psychiatrists several times due to her mental health concerns. Then, when it came to the relationship with Brad, he was never supportive of her or helpful with her mental health issues. According to Abby, he called her crazy and was never there for her emotionally. He was manipulative and he was also violent towards her. So the psychiatrist that examined Abby concluded that she suffers from borderline personality disorder. He said that Abby's behaviors as witnessed by friends, as well as her account of what happened when she stabbed Brad, are consistent with someone who has borderline personality disorder. He said that 99% of people have better coping strategies and are better at controlling their anger than Abby. He said that in someone with BPD, when they get angry, the thinking part of their brain shuts off, so she really doesn't know what she's doing while in that fit of rage. The psychiatrist said that it was highly likely that Abby was in a time of crisis at the time of the killing, and ultimately, her diagnosis is consistent with diminished responsibility. Now, as we know, Abby and Brad have three children together, but I do want to note that in the weeks before Brad's death, Abby fell pregnant again, but this time she got an abortion because she did not think it was healthy to bring another child into the relationship. So he said that this, in addition to Brad's cheating, all caused increased stress in the days leading to the murder that resulted in even more heightened emotions, causing her to lash out. However, the psychiatrist for the prosecution said that yes, Abby did have a personality disorder. She was emotionally unstable and often acted off her emotions, but that didn't mean she didn't know what she was doing. She wasn't in any sort of psychosis or blackout state where she didn't know what was going on. She was upset with her partner for his infidelity and for breaking up with her. She knew exactly what she was doing when she left the argument to grab a knife before coming back to stab Brad. She then had the mental capacity to try to clean up the blood and wash her clothes before calling 999 to get him help. After the stabbing, she spoke with Laura and police with relatively clear and concise answers. That all shows that she was capable of rational thought. After her initial arrest, it was found that she had alcohol as well as cocaine and traces of antidepressants in her system, but the psychiatrist does not believe that this caused her not to know what she was doing. She was fully responsible for her actions. Abby did take the stand to testify in her own defense, and she continued to say that she did not mean to kill Brad, that she lashed out and she only realized what happened after it was over. She said that she feels bad about lying to the dispatcher about him stabbing himself. She said that she loved Brad, but she felt very betrayed, hurt, and upset with what he had done to her. When asked about those text messages and voice messages where she literally said that she wanted to kill him, she basically said that she didn't actually mean it when she said it. She was also asked about how Sophie, her friend, heard her yelling and screaming, telling Brad to shut the F up, and heard her beating up on him while he was on the phone with her. And she basically said that she doesn't remember any of that. She doesn't remember beating him up before his death. She also doesn't remember actually stabbing him. So after hearing the evidence and arguments from both sides, the prosecution and defense made their closing arguments. And after that, the jury was off for deliberations. And after about five hours of deliberations, they came back with their verdict. They found that Abby White was guilty for the murder of Brad Lewis. After the verdict, it was time for sentencing. And of course, Brad's family had a lot to say about how this murder had affected them. 
Brad's father, Steve, said that since his son's death, he has had an overwhelming sense of grief and pain. He misses the way that Brad always could make you smile, how kind and loving he was towards his family. His mother, Rachel, said that this loss will be with her for the rest of her life. She is devastated that Brad, the loving father he was, will not be there to watch his children grow up into the amazing adults that she knows they will ultimately be. At the sentencing, the judge reiterated that Brad was a well-loved father who had his whole life ahead of him. Not only did their children lose their father, but they also lost their mother with her selfish actions. Plus, she absolutely traumatized one of her children, their three-year-old son, who had to watch as their mother brutally stabbed their father right in front of them. With Abby's crime, she automatically qualifies for a life sentence, but the judge's job is to set the minimum term based on aggravating and mitigating factors considered in the case with a starting point of at least 15 years behind bars. The aggravating factors considered in this case were the fact that their child was a witness to what she did, the nature of their relationship where she constantly publicly humiliated him and intimidated him throughout the relationship, as well as the fact that she had a history of violence against him. Of course, the mitigating factors are the lack of premeditation, her troubled childhood and her personality disorder, as well as the fact that she immediately showed remorse and did call 999 as soon as it happened. With all of these factors considered, the judge decided on a minimum of 18 years served before she will be eligible for parole. So that is where the case sits as of right now. Obviously, with this case, there were red flags from the very beginning. But with relationships like this one, especially knowing that the two of them started dating so young, I can see how Brad felt trapped and like he couldn't leave Abby. I don't and never will condone cheating and I do understand why Abby felt the way she did, but she was also cheating and she clearly didn't have much regard for Brad or how he felt or what he wanted. I think she did make the entire relationship about herself, and I think that Brad was just exhausted from the relationship as a whole. And the worse it got, the harder it got to leave, and I do believe that Abby went into sort of a blind rage when she stabbed Brad. I do think that in that moment, she did want to kill him. But I think that as soon as that first stab happened, she regretted it and wanted to help him. But obviously, that doesn't mean that she deserves any less than what she got. Just because you show remorse and regret your actions, that doesn't bring the person back. I totally, totally believe that she suffers from BPD pretty badly, and I hope that she gets the therapy that she desperately needs in prison. This case is yet another example of a relationship that we can learn from. Obviously, Abby is not mentally healthy. I think that's very clear. Obviously, Brad felt really guilty and truly was worried that she would harm herself. But if you or someone you love ever finds himself in this type of situation, I think the best thing to do for everybody, including that person, is to leave and help that person get the help that they need. Because if they are truly suicidal, they obviously need mental health help and you can help them get it and you being around and in a toxic relationship with them is never going to help them. But if they aren't suicidal and you know it's just a manipulation tactic, then help will still be beneficial to them to let them know that this behavior isn't okay and doesn't work. If you are in a relationship like this and someone ends up taking their own life after threatening their own life and you still leave them, it's not your fault, especially if the relationship is so very toxic and you needed to get out for your own mental health. Their actions are not your responsibility, and that might sound harsh for people who have gone through this, but it's really not your fault at the end of the day if someone takes their own life. Obviously, when I say that, I'm not meaning people that are abusive physically, emotionally, verbally. I'm not talking about abusers who lead their partner or their victim into suicide. That's obviously not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about situations like this one where one person is toxic and they won't let you leave and they know that you know, they are the one responsible for all of the issues and yet they still won't let you leave. If you leave and they harm themselves, 
it is not your fault. Because with cases like this, unfortunately, so many times, all of this escalates and sometimes it does result in terror. And at some points in relationships like this one, you need to think it's either them or me. They're either going to hurt me or they might hurt themselves if I leave. But at the end of the day, you leaving is almost always what is best for the situation. Obviously, qualifiers here, I've said them enough, but you leaving a situation like this is always better for the situation as a whole and for that other person. So let this case be an example of that. Don't let things escalate to the point that they did in this case. But that is all I have for today's video. And now I want to know your guys' thoughts. What do you think of Abby's behaviors? Do you think she meant to kill Brad or do you believe what she says? What do you think of Brad staying in this relationship to begin with? Do you think she would have actually harmed herself if he left? Or do you think it was just a threat? What do you think of her charge and sentence? Do you agree that she should have been sentenced to life for murder? Or do you agree that this fits more with manslaughter? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!